He is a four-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, a two-time Bassmaster Elite Series champion, a member of the Bassmaster Century Club, and he is a one-point lead in the Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year race with just two events set to go. We have the C-O-double-B. Brandon Cobb joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Well, it is Wednesday, so here we go again. Welcome one, welcome all. Friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks, you're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. So welcome in, and um, this is a very timely show we have here this week. Because as you are listening to this right now, I'm not physically here. I'm in Plattsburgh, New York, or at least on my way to Plattsburgh, New York, for the final two Bassmaster Elite Series events of 2023. And man, what a season, what a progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year race we have going on. Just a few weeks ago, we talked to Stone Cold Kyle Welcher, who is currently in second place by just one point over this week's guest, which is the C-O-double-B, Brandon Cobb. And there's a whole bunch of other stories throughout the top 10, and it's going to be, I mean, to me, this is setting up to be one of the most exciting finales to this season, or season finales that we've ever seen. I mean, to have an angler of the race, angler of the year race so tight, I mean, it is one point, and to have it come down to this, um, it's it's Disney. It's a storybook. I mean, that's what you want. You want it going down to the final. I mean, let, and let's hope it stays just as tight after the second last event. You know, once we get through Champlain, which starts tomorrow morning, then we're going ahead directly to um, Clayton, New York, Thousand Islands. See if we can crack a hundred pounds there again. And we're also going to uh, crown our Angler of the Year, a progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year, and, of course, our Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year, which is being led by Joey Cifuentes, who was recently on this show yet again, and he is dominating the Rookie of the Year race. But Koya Fujita is not out of it. There's, I mean, that, that race is not done. It is going to be an awesome way to finish the year. I mean, I know it's just my job and everything, but there are some years like it's cool when we have years where an angler runs away with it. I get that. It's cool for that angler, you know, but you want it to be, I mean, you want the finish line. You, you know what I mean? Like you want your guy to win the race, but you want it to be tight right down to the wire. And, uh, it looks like it's going to be very, very tight and no better person to talk about than the current leader. In progressive Bassmaster Angler in the year points, he's got a one-point lead. He has 573, and Kyle Welcher has 572. So you think of just how important, like it, all these events. We've had seven events already, and those two are, guys are separated by one spot. It, it's going to be a fun, fun tournament. But before the tournament starts, you can listen to this. With our progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year leader, we don't go any further. I guess we do go further. We, Well, let's just hook up with him right now. The C-O-double-B, Brandon Cobb. The C-O-double-B, Brandon Cobb, how are you? I'm doing great. You're leading progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year by one point. One point. There's a slim like, margin. I mean, on behalf of Bass... And everybody that covers the events, thank you. Thank you for a lot. Like, Because for a while there, at our last event on Lake St. Clair, it looked like you were going to leave with a big lead. But you had a little bit of a slip on day three. Was that on purpose just to make this all so much more dramatic? Uh, well, the waves. See, so everybody knows. Everybody's always like, oh, Brandon doesn't like fishing up north, right? That's what people think. <laughs> But I don't hate fish up north. I hate fishing in waves. And it was windy and rough on day three. And that's why I didn't catch much. I'm not, I'm not, we just don't do that around here. I'm not good at it. But really, it all comes down to the uh, Sabine River. Was the, um, That was the, the problem with the season so far. A, a 50th looks real nice there. 
<laughs> not, yeah. Not a 90 second. But no, the St. Clair, that that uh last day, that wind just got me, man. I couldn't couldn't fish well. So do you fish in it? Like the, if you do you hate it enough? Like there's some anglers that hate it enough that they just don't even make it part. They just fish where it's not. Did did you fish <laughs> in it and you're just not good at it? Or is yeah, it yeah, I fished in it. It just I don't it's hard for me to even like focus and be like I feel like I'm never presenting my bait well all day when I'm in like three footers and ways. I know guys from up north, they're just used to it, but like I didn't grow up fishing in that. I don't ever would like, but it's rough on heart when you go to a pocket. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just, it, it, uh, it's always a challenge for me fishing in that rough water. So that's clearly going to be a problem for you throughout your career. How do we mm -hmm. rectify that problem? Like, is that something do you, it, or do you just do hope more? that you get lots of points <laughs> and <laughs> hold back on the rough days? Uh, we just got to do it more, I guess. Like, uh, the tournaments, I mean, we, we, the thing is like, well, we have maybe two a year on big water yeah. generally. So like, I don't get a lot of like situations where I have to do it. And then well, I say we have two tournaments a year and then like usually two out of the four days aren't rough. So yeah. it's like it's just I don't do it a lot and uh I, I can do it more if I'm throwing like power baits and stuff but like St. Clair finesse fishing using the front looking sonar which you know is not my favorite thing to do in general and uh in the rough water it was just hard for me to fish that final day and I mean I caught some fish I just didn't ever get any of the big bites yeah if you don't like forward facing sonar and you don't like rough water you probably don't like Lake St. Clair <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't well there i don't mind using it as much because like so i'm not gonna say i don't like front facing sonar it's not my favorite thing to do i don't find as much enjoyment using front facing sonar as i do other types of fishing yeah and uh the thing about st Clair is it keeps me from doing something stupid and going to do other things because like what else you gonna do at St. Clair. <laughs> like that's that's just, it's like that's it. You drift in the middle of the lake. That's where the fish are. See, if we're on somewhere like Champlain or Ontario or something, the whole time I'm out there like trying to active target for one. I'm like, man, you know, that bank looks pretty good over there. You might should go check that out. But St. Clair, you don't I don't worry about it. I'm just like, well, I'm gonna stay out here in the middle because that's where they are. So is it something where and and I hate to do this. I mean, it feels like every podcast we get into the forward facing sonar conversation, <laughs> but it it is the conversation because you're literally you're seeing people that are really good at it dominate. You're seeing anglers that are not willing to do it getting hurt in situations. And I agree with where you're coming from, where you're like, it's not as enjoyable. I mean, it turns the whole season into bed fishing, which bed fishing can be fun if you do it for a month or two. But for a whole seat, like, I think that the magic of like, it's super cool to see a fish chase your jerk bait and be like, he's got it. That, that is yep. a cool experience. But there's something I don't know about you, but for me, there's something that is missing because it's that you're in fishing. I, you have instinct. to focus just you on feeling instinct. Yeah. You lose instincts. That's what it is. Like, I, I think I think you could be a good, a successful fisherman with zero instincts now with it yeah that's what it feels like to me and, and i've made my career because i make good decisions instinct based like half the times i've won tournaments or done well i don't know why i did it <laughs> i couldn't tell you it's not like i I'm, but you know i uh the bass should be doing this because the water's 68.7 degrees no it's not that it's i'm running down like man that looks good let me go try that and it works and uh it just kind of it diminishes that i'm not saying it takes it away but it diminishing diminishes the impact of that well, it just, it gives you one sense that overrides everything. It doesn't matter uh -huh. what you feel. It doesn't matter what yep. you hear. It doesn't matter what you think because you can right see there. a goblin <laughs> it's right there yep. on the screen. Yep. Um, it, it is. It's, it's different. It is. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think I, I disagree with the whole, like, it's going to decimate fisheries. Cause I think that you're already seeing fish adjust to it you know what i mean when they feel it in yeah. different fisheries and stuff what do you think the long-term impact of it is i don't think it'll affect it'll make bass harder to catch but the yeah. thing that i think it could hurt is like some of your larger fish I, i'm trying to think like well for instance like santee or sandy cooper you know santee's we bass fish there all the time but it's a real popular catfish in lake right yeah well, they've got to where they're just targeting like 60 and 80 pound catfish they just scope around 
and active target around until they see a big catfish and they catch them. And so, wow. like, I could see it hurting something like that or sturgeon maybe on places you're allowed to fish for those, something like that. I don't know if it'll ever affect bass that much, but I think some of the large, like, fish that are really, really old that you don't really want to just be targeting the only mature ones, things like that. So like, do, you, yeah. do you dislike it enough that, like, if there was a vote tomorrow and they said, hey. It's gone. It, it's gone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even have, I didn't even have to finish the question. Um, <laughs> well, so like I'm confident in using it. Let, let the Lorenz Active Target it does what it's supposed to. Like I said, I just don't have that much fun using it, and yeah. it screws me up more than it helps me a lot of times because I don't really like doing it. I guess I don't fully commit to it. Like so, to be honest, so I unhooked mine at Okeechobee this year, and I hooked it back up the first day of practice for Saint Clair. So you have not used it this the year. entire season to get to where you are. No. Wow. That's very cool. So and and the reason I unhooked it is because I think to be successful with it, you have to fully commit, right? And all it does, in my opinion, if you're trying to fish shallow, like let's just say I'm fishing docks or something like that down the bank, and I'm trying like I got it on and I keep glancing at it, all it does is make you like half as efficient. Like you'll fish half as many docks. You'll fish half as far down the bank because you, you, you like look out and you're like, oh, there's a little brush pile. Let me toss that. Yeah, you might catch a couple more fish, but I just fished two miles more bank without it. Yeah. So that's why I, I like to not even have the option of it when I don't think I need it for the style of fishing I'm doing. So clearly, you feel felt these three northern events. You you're gonna need it. You're gonna need it. Yeah. Yeah. The small mouse, small mouse spotted bass, things like that. You about gotta gotta do it a little bit. So going into, I mean, you actually went into the final three events for the first time in most of the season, really, chasing someone for angler of the year. Did you like that? I mean, there's a little part of me that thinks you're a genius and you totally like every interview I heard you, you're like, I don't even like small. I'm allergic to small mouth, as a matter of fact. <laughs> was was that intentional? <laughs> it was not intentional, but it did, it was kind of nice. So, so like nobody's I mean, if you've never done it to the pro level with a camera and stuff, so a camera's awesome, right? Yeah. But you want a camera when you know you're gonna catch them. Or when you think you might catch them. When it's day one and you got a camera and all the eyes on you're like, man, I might not catch a bass. This kind of sucks, you know? <laughs> but by day two or three, if you have a camera, clearly it's, you got a camera because you caught it. Like, you got a little cop It's like that. But so it, it was kind of nice this last one. Not really any pressure going into day one. Yeah, no, I, I was actually surprised. And it just shows how hot and cold the, the fishing media is. Like, it literally... I saw you everywhere and then you dropped a few points. I mean, you're still in second and I saw, you nowhere. Bet all of a I sudden. Bet um, Does he still fish? He retired. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do anything to prepare for these final three events? Um, you know, I mean, obviously you're going into an event where you've, you've already said you don't like rough water. You've already said mm -hmm. you don't like forward facing sonar, but you also have one of the most, coveted titles in pro fishing within your grasp really at this point so did you do anything different going into those um i mean i've definitely been like fishing around here i've been like trying to get better with the forward facing sonar but the one thing is too like champlain i've done relatively well at champlain over the years you don't have to use it there you don't have to fish deep there like the, those yeah. fish that's a unique northern fishery in the instance you can catch smallmouth and largemouth together you can catch both tar like your target like if you're largemouth style fishing you may still catch smallmouths so yeah. that place is a little unique and then uh ontario you know it it kind of depends uh, up there it's just i like i actually enjoy fishing the river but the lake if it's in play it's hard to compete in the river. It's just the fact of it. You know, I finished 11th at St. Lawrence when we went out of Waddington. And I think the simple reason I did that was because it was a hundred miles to the lake and people didn't want to run it. Yeah. And so the whole field didn't run it. So going out of Clayton, it's a little, it's a little different because I, I like, I like the river. I, I actually, the St. Lawrence river is fun to fish to me. I just don't like it. Ontario so much. <laughs> 
So obviously you have Champlain before that event. And I, I think obviously what you do in that event probably will it deem, will. you know, what where you're at. But let's just say you go into the final event and it's still separated by a point. Are you going to the lake? Are you going to the river? Or are you giving me a no comment? <laughs> uh it's hard to say at this point because that would probably be a two days of practice in the lake. Uh oh, I didn't catch much. Now let me fish in the river. But no, it uh I, I think if it's really tight, you almost have to if if the weather looks suitable where you can actually fish in the lake, you have to fish the lake. Cause you know to top to top ten, top twenty of that tournament, I'm not saying you have to be out there, but it's a little bit easy. like catching smashing them in the river is a like a good day in the lake yeah <laughs> like so, so i mean that's just the fact of it so i i don't know it it's hard to say but i am glad champlain's first i mean i've told everybody you don't want to base what you're doing or your plan necessarily off points but when it's the last term of the year if i do real well at champlain and we do have a big point sleeve like well i just need a check which can be done in the river 100 percent, and it's more my style of fishing so it'll be nice for that being the last one where i can you know get a get a gauge of what i need to do Obviously, you're battling it out with Kyle Welcher. Do you know Kyle very well? I don't know him real well, but I think we fish very similar. Yeah. Like, just watching him, and I'm glad I'm not, like, battling out with Chris Johnston going to <laughs> north. But, no, nothing against Welcher. But I think Welcher and me are kind of like, we fish a lot the same, and he may love the smallmouth fisheries, but I feel like we kind of have the same. We like the type of lakes we like, which are not. Small mouth fisheries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does that what does that tell you about this season that you're one and two? Does that tell you anything? Oh, it's been a shallow water power fish. Or I'm I haven't power fish, that's wrong, but a shallow water, you know, junk fishing, just throw it what you want, instinct type season. That's what it's been. How many fish have you caught on a wacky rig worm this year? <laughs> I, I was thinking about that the other day. I, I honestly have no idea. I, I told Zoom, and I've got like, I kept running out of fluke sticks. I, like I, I, every tournament, I'd call Zoom. I, I used all my fluke sticks again. We're we're out. I used eleven packs last week, and then so now I've got like I was cleaning out my truck yesterday. I've got like two forty pound boxes of them, good to go. But I haven't caught one in the last two tournaments on it. Probably should have thrown it the whole time at Sabine. That was probably that was probably my problem. I see, you know, going into Sabine, I said, he's going to have a stellar tournament because I figured, you know, I've seen you all year long. You've had, a, you know, a bunch of great finishes that way. Why? What distracted you at Sabine to change things? Mother Nature got me at Sabine. I actually had a really good practice, but I caught him at low tide. And I thought, like, you know, the laws of nature, there's a low tide every day. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> and uh to get to the tournament time the tide just never went out i mean it went down but it never really went out and the fish i was catching just were uncatchable at high tide and i basically waited the whole day for them to bite they didn't bite and then it was too late to do anything else <laughs> so that was, the tide got me there sabine sabine will will get you i mean it, it's yeah. uh it, nobody's safe there you know you know what no. i mean like there's no, no. I don't think there's a safe play and there's also not like a, this is a guaranteed. If you do this, you're going to leave with a check. Yeah. Like it, it's a, it's a weird one. Um, it's my favorite place we fished this season though. Like I love it. And I just did that. Like I like that style of fishing. So, okay. Tell me why, why do you love that? I mean, there, we hear a lot of people say we should never go there, but yeah, I mean, I, I love cool. it because the crowd and, and the diversity. And I think it's, <laughs> The gambles and stuff like that. That's what I think is cool about it. What do you think is cool about it? I mean, I I like the tournaments where like you don't know if you're gonna catch a limit. And I like the tournaments where a big fish is a big impact, right? Like yeah. if you catch a four pounder at the Sabine, it's like it makes a huge impact. It's really dramatic. Like from people watching, it's dramatic when you catch a big one. Like when we go up north or some of those lakes where everybody catches them, it's like, oh, that's a giant. Like, well, that one looks like two ounces bigger than last 72 he caught <laughs> and, and like that's what i like about sabine and i just like like that's a that is a shallow water like cut your brain off pick everything apart type place and that's what i like i just picked the wrong area when i was there but 
with that being said, I would, I still, it's like my favorite, one of my favorite places to fish. And that's what, see, after the season's over, that's what I love to do around here at home. I just go all the rivers, cr- the creeks like that. And that's what I do. I mean, I just love to, I take my aluminum boat and I just fish shallow. Like I don't have any graphs. I don't do anything. I just flip, flip and buzz bait basically, which is what Sabine is. Is that what you grew up doing? Is that like, uh, yeah, it, it is definitely like how I learned to fish, but uh-huh. then it's just like, that's what I do in the off season here when I'm fun fishing. So like, I don't know. It's just something that I've became very in tune with that style of fishing. It's just, yeah, it's my favorite. No, I mean, and then I get it. I mean, there's certain, I, I grew up fishing a lot of creeks and stuff like that. And, yeah. and like one of the most relaxing things for me to do is go to like a nothing Creek that doesn't get hardly That's any probably. pressure and walk a lot. Like, cause I didn't have a boat as a kid and just yeah. walk along and do, I don't know. That's what I, I think it's like something Saint-Claire. built in you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. where this is like all oh, those noises and everything. That's what calms me down from being a weirdo. Oh um, yeah. That's my favorite thing. That's why I did the week before we went to St. Clair. I went walking a Creek around here catfishing. I like to wade in the Creek and drop in the holes for catfish. And he, how big do they get? Usually when you're fishing a creek like that, they're like 12 inches, like the good size to eat if you want to keep yeah. them, like 10 to 14 inches. They get in log jams. You just walk the creek and drop a little piece of cut bait in log jams. Nice. We don't have that many. We don't have alligators or really that many snakes here, so you could do it here. <laughs> Some places I wouldn't recommend doing it. Would you ever noodle catfish? I've done it a ton. R- come on, really? Oh, yeah, I used to do it like uh, every week in the summer uh, or in the early, early summer and spring when I was growing up. I haven't done it in three or four years, but I've caught like hundreds and hundreds. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we, I had no idea you were a noodler. Oh, yeah. When I was in high school and college a little bit, we we did it. We do it under boat ramps, though. We never did like the riverbanks much. I do it under boat ramps because they make the same holes under boat ramps. And at least in boat ramps, you don't really have any air there. So if if there's something there, it's probably a catfish, not yeah. another a beaver or a turtle or something like that. But no, I've got a bunch of like 40 to 60 pounders doing it. Wow. What's what the, what's the biggest one? The 60 or? Uh, I caught one that was like 67 one time. That's the biggest I've ever caught. But usually like the ones you catch usually like average, like around 20 to 30. They're pretty, it's pretty fun. Wow. I don't like using, you know, a lot of people use a pole with a hook on it, like with the noodle. Like that's why it's called noodling. You know that, right? Yeah. yeah oh, no, you okay, explain to me what, okay, why. So it's called noodling because you use a PVC pole. Uh, well, what people do, they use a, if you can't reach them with your hand, they use a PVC pole with a treble hook with a piece of pool noodle on the end. And you stick it in the hole, they bite it, you pull them to the edge, and then you grab them. But I don't like using the hook because then you got a hook and a catfish to deal with. So I always just use my hands. That's the way I always did it. Just straight, like we called it grappling, but Using your hand, I'd carry a PVC pole with no hook. So if they got too far, because sometimes they get so far back in the hole, you couldn't reach them, and then you can corral them to the front and grab them. <laughs> Dude, I'm really blown. So I've never, I've never talked to a noodler. But I mean, all I know about noodling is watching Her- Hannah Barron's videos, and she looks like yeah. a super badass pulling these giant catfish out. But what, what is that experience like? Like the first few times where you're like, like literally, you feel that, like. I've been told that the fish kind of ingests your arm somewhat. Oh, they do. They do. Well, so flathead catfish, like, will eat your entire hand, arm, like, up to your elbow. And then you just grab on, and then you got to reach your other hand and get their gills, and you kind of arm wrestle them out, you know, or bear, like, wrap your legs around them and come out. But the uh, the blue catfish are the ones, they nip your fingertips like this. They will turn all your fingernails purple. They like to just bite just your fingertips when you reach in. You know it's a blue cat immediately. When you reach in the hole, but yeah, they attack you. Uh, wait. So the key is to grab them like the first two or three times they bite you. Cause if you miss them, they get too far back in there and then really hard to get, then they don't want to bite. Gotcha. But the first, when you first reach in there, they're pretty angry. I got so my, you- a few years ago or the one of the last few times we did it, my wife was with me, Amy, and I swam down and I reached in a hole and one bit me and she kind of wanted to do it, but kind of didn't, you know? And she's like, <laughs> Okay, let, let me go do it. I said, I think, I thought it was like a 10 to 15 pounder. Like, it's a small one, go down and get it. So I got her to jump in, swim down, and she goes down for a second. And then she comes up, she said, I can't do it. I can't stick my hand in there. So she blocks it, and I go back down, and I reach in there. And it turned out to be like a 35 or 40 pounder. So I'm actually probably a good thing she didn't grab it and <laughs> swam <laughs> off with her for the first one. Wow. Wow. So worst noodling injury that you've personally had or witnessed 
Uh, I've just got got cut a bunch by like stuff on the bottom, like tore up by the catfish. But I've I've seen some of my buddies, well, not really buddies, but people I've been with doing it for. They reach in on the boat ramp, and the catfish will kind of bite you and like pull you, and they actually either they hit their face on the boat ramp or the catfish shoots out and hits them in the face. They're bad about that. Like when you reach down, if they want to get out, they'll shoot out and they'll actually like bust your nose, black your eyes, whatever they shoot out. You don't ever put your face in front of the hole. Yeah. That's number one rule of noodling. I imagine. (laughs) So do you like, so what are they just biting your hand or like, are you soaking your hand in some? No, it's whatever you put in there. They're pissed. Like they're, they're just pissed bite. you're in their zone yeah, like you stick your foot in there some of the holes like you can't reach your arm so you can stick your leg in but <laughs> <laughs> no they bite whatever's in there you can actually hear it so when somebody's down like usually the holes are usually a little too wide so you'll get somebody to stand with their feet blocking the edge of the hole while you reach like by their legs and when one bites somebody's hand like when you're the blocker you can hear it in the boat ramp it sounds like like it's like like you hear a thud when the catfish bites their hand <laughs> Dang. <laughs> wow. How old were you when you started noodling? Uh, I would say about the time I could drive, like 16 or so, we started doing it. And then I did it up till like I was in college. So I don't know, 21 or so. And I just haven't done it in years. I kind of don't really want to break a finger before an elite tournament or something, you know? So yeah, I, haven't done I, imagine, it in years. I imagine 16 to 21 is prime noodling years. Uh, like- I think so. <laughs> that, that's the age that you probably not quite smart enough to, uh, no, that's probably not the best <laughs> idea. But no, it's, yeah. it's, it's actually really fun. It's one of those things. First time you do it, you're like, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. <laughs> then when you catch one or one bites, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. That was kind of fun. Let's go find another one. Wow. I, I kind of want to come noodling with you. So, would you? <laughs> so, if I were to come visit, could we go noodling or is this we, like. We, no, we could do it, but it's too, it's too hot now. You might find one in the summer. It's like when the water first gets warm enough where you can stand to get in it then that's when it's good because that's when they're like spawning or whatever they're up in there in the holes because they go in the holes to spawn wow so, so it's just like bed fishing but with your arm yeah that's why i said when you stick your hand in there they're mad <laughs> you thought a small mouth gets pissed when your ned rig falls in there you see a 40 pound flathead when your hand goes in so is there any movement added to the like when you put your hand in do you just put it in there or like are you you, uh, usually you don't you don't <laughs> like get it, you don't even get it all the way in there and he's like after it wow yeah huh. at first but then like i said they get kind of smart like they get back in there and sometimes they'll get so far back in you like can't reach it. like they're just can't reach them wow do you think that you might be the first noodler ever to win angler of the year if you pull this off uh, very very likely very likely very but likely. maybe yeah i mean but i maybe. didn't think you were a noodler before this conversation <laughs> i don't know Every time I talk to you, you're an onion. Many, many different layers. I totally had no idea you were a noodler. I had a variety of hobbies. Yeah, I'm learning that. I'm learning that. (laughs) So to play devil's advocate, what stopped you from taking the break and living in the North, knowing the position that you're in? Yeah, so I debated that before Champlain, like especially after St. Clair, you know, just staying. And I don't know, like to me, if I like, obviously we can't fish Champlain as off limits yeah. so, or, or Ontario or either. I feel like a lot, all those Northern places fish so differently that like I, every time I've ever pre-practiced, I know it's completely different because I pre-practiced the body of water we're on, but every time I've ever like even done a lot of research or done a lot of pre-practice or fish surrounding lakes, you get like a wrong idea or I do. Like I always get an idea of what I want to do before I ever get to the tournament waters. And it's like, it's literally never helped me. So like I thought about staying just practicing smallmouth fishing or whatever, but then like, I didn't want to go to a lake where just the shout, like maybe the deep rock pile style smallmouth fishing is really good. Or maybe they fall a bait around on that lake. And then you go somewhere that's just doesn't, they don't act the same. And you're like already, I don't know. It's just different. And like, I know the lakes in the South, obvious, obviously. So like if I'd have went, we had a tournament on Hartwell and I went to Lake Russell for the whole week before it, Lake Russell's one lake below Hartwell. It really wouldn't help me that much because I know Russell fish is completely different than Hartwell. And that's why, and if you, if you did what worked on Russell and Hartwell, you're probably not going to catch them. So it's kind of like that. That's why I, I thought about it, but I said, wasn't worth the risk to do it. 
I get that. I get that. I mean, you hear people all the time say, I went to the neighboring lake and, and sometimes even people will use that as a reason they did well. And, and I, but I've also thought about, I mean, very rarely does a lake get dominated the same way the next week. You know what I mean? So if you're fishing, let's say that we're on deep rock points and you were fishing it. Yeah. Maybe you made a paycheck, but while you were chasing the the pattern that you had established on another lake, you might have missed where they were really going to be that week and, and potentially winning that yeah. tournament. Exactly. That's why I, I, I've i pre-practiced probably seven or eight times over my career or even went to surrounding lakes, and it's never helped. And some of my worst tournaments are when I actually did pre-practice. So, like, it's not worth the risk to me or effort. <laughs> It, it that that's the thing that makes me laugh when you read all and i mean there has been some stuff over the last 12 months in pro fishing um but you read everybody like everybody gets spots everybody in my experience i'll be honest guilty i've gotten spots while going to shoot a show and stuff like that and i swear to you none of them none of them have ever like you know what i mean like it always at the end of of the you chase I remember me and Overstreet went to Lake Austin once. I shouldn't even said the name of the lake. So now I'm going to, the guy, well, so the guy gave us some information for Lake Austin. We were in Texas and dude, it, it, we caught a bunch of little rats and whatever. And I'm like, this just doesn't look right. It, it, and at that time, the whole top end of Lake Austin, which we had avoided the first day of our trip was full of hydrilla and just like They're the greenest, fire. they were just loaded in there. But because we were told to go left out of the ramp rather than right, we chased their tail where, so I, I'm not a, I don't think that, I think that even if a guy got his spots for every tournament all year long, I, I don't think that that works out good for anyone anyways. You, I think the only time it works is like unique lakes. Like let's say like a Tennessee river ledge lake, they get on the same ledges every year. If somebody yeah. knows all the good ledges, maybe like that or brush pile lake where you know they're going to be on brush piles. That's like, it, but other than that, especially in the spring, because you know as well as I do, the spring, the fish aren't the same two weeks in a row, hardly ever. And no. you could like somebody will ask me like, hey, what do I do on Hartwell in April? I'm like, well, I don't know. They could be pre-spawn. They could be spawning or they could be already chasing hair and the hair could be spawned. There's no telling. It changes so much in the spring every year. Even the time frame does on when fish do things. Yeah, and, and the smallmouth deal, you could send a few people to some smallmouth stuff that would work, but I also argue that I don't know that it's the winning stuff. Like, exactly. and and who's that good? Like, who has that buddy that's just that good that he that can, good. yeah, here's how you win. Like, I mean, you got a group of dudes trying to do it every single freaking week, but yeah. somebody can just stay at home and send you some digits. Um, how often do you think that happens in our tournaments, if it happens at all? I think I think it does. I don't know how much specific spot stuff happens. And if it is specific spot stuff, I think it's stuff that like maybe five years ago, they went to this lake with somebody, you know, for no reason. And they're like, oh, I remember all these spots. I think that probably happens. I don't think as far as actually info rule breaking, I don't think it happens a lot. I think what does happen a lot, though, is go to surrounding lakes like Hey, I'm on. Or, hey, I got a terminal Hartwell next week, so I can't fish Hartwell. But will you go to Russell with me? And they go with their buddy. Like, man, on Lake Russell, I like to fish these clay points. I think that type stuff happens. You know, like kind of insinuated, like patterns on surrounding lakes, things like that. But I don't, I don't think straight up blatant go throw at this brush pile where it happens very much. Yeah, yeah. It, are you happy with how the off limit rules are now like the yeah i'm fine with i'm i like i like the only thing i wish happened more is once the schedule's announced you know our lakes are off limits that's just that's the way the rule works the problem is there everyone always gets wind of where we're going before it's announced Uh i think the rule should be adapted to if you have an idea the tournament's going somewhere it's off limits in your mind if if the lake is if it's potentially on the schedule, if you hear that it's on the schedule, then it's off limits. Or it should just be completely secret until it's released, one or the other. Yeah. That, I mean, well, that that's something. I mean, I think Bass would rather it be completely secret, but it yeah. gets out. You know what I mean? Tourism, like, yeah. I mean, tourism, yeah. it, somebody <clears throat> has to set it all up. So, yeah, right around. 
and it, it, you know, but I, 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 I've always wondered about that rule just because I just don't like, I mean, and it's also got to be really tough on people who live on bodies of water and things like, you know what I it mean? Is. And it, it puts you guys in such a weird spot, like that awkward, I see it all the time, like where somebody's pumping gas and they're like, it's hey, kidding. you know where the fish are? And they're like, no, 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 don't tell me. No. There's no way to say that to a local nicely without them thinking you're a dick. Oh, uh, no, they hate you every time you do that. And like, yeah, like you said, the local late, like when we went to Hartwell for the classic, there, I had like nightmares for like a month. I'd like wake up, I'd have a nightmare that like my buddy was out there and his boat broke, and I went to help him get off the lake, and I'm like, oh god, I'm on the lake. Oh no! <laughs> Literally, I would wake up in the middle of the night. Like it's hard when it's local. It's hard because I couldn't even talk to my friends because they all fish Hartwell. <laughs> So yeah. it's like, could even, we all talk about fishing. That's what we talk about. So I couldn't even talk to anybody. Yeah, it's weird. It's it's it's, it's a weird rule. I and I don't even know what the. I mean, as long as the anglers are happy with it, I'm happy with it. Basically, it's the way yeah. I look at those. But it's. Um, I'm happy with it if it was followed the way it was meant to be, mm-hmm. because I think, like you said, the info getting does happen, but it happens before it's announced. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not illegal, but should it be? Yes. And but it's such a weird sport specific rule, too. Because I mean, hey, if you wanted to be a pro golfer, you'd have a dude who would walk or or a lady that would walk along with you and would tell you what club you hit best from here, exactly, you know, how many yards it is, what the wind is, and give you advice. And and that's okay, but that's okay. But in pro fishing, people think that if somebody gets information a month ahead of time, that it's, they're, it's just weird to me. Like, it is it, it is weird. I agree. But the problem is, if we were allowed to get info, like you said, I don't think it really helps that much. But there is certain situations where it's going to help. Yeah. And it come down to who has the biggest network. Because yeah. like me, I'm not, I mean, I am, I, obviously, I'm. I have social media and do okay. Like have a decent following things, but some people with, you know, millions of followers between all platforms, they're probably gonna have a better chance at getting good info on a lake than I will. <laughs> so that's the problem with it. Yeah. Then you could make the argument that most of the people following yours are probably same people, you know, and then there's <laughs> some dudes with a million followers that he'd have to sort <laughs> through. <laughs> that's Plus, good point. Good yeah, point. no. Um it, it's it's uh I think that that's one of the toughest things for you guys to deal with. You know what I mean? Just always having to like do you worry? Like you said you oh, had nightmares. Yeah. Do you worry about like I'll get rent cuz you are the kind of guy and I I hate to even say it, but you'd be the kind of guy that because you think about it, the more you worry about things, I would imagine things like lie detectors are tougher on somebody like you. There's some oh, people sure. Yeah, like I feel like I might would fail a lie detector even though I didn't do anything, because <laughs> like, well, like because I'll be fishing down the lake and some guy on the dock will be like, I saw a four pounder under my dock the other day. I'm like, well, I didn't ask him that, but now I feel like I can't fish his dock anymore, and I'll literally troll around his dock in the tournament, and not throw at it, because I'm like, I think I'm breaking a rule if I fish this dock. Wow. Like, wow. It, yeah, like it. I think, but some people, it's just all about how it's in your mind. Yeah, it, right. that's the problem with lie detectors. Like, I think I would fail for something that a lot of people probably would. <laughs> Just because I, I don't like, I, I'm too by the book on the rules, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, but but it, I mean, if it's something you worry about, that's also something you want to safeguard. And it, it's all it, lie detectors are all to the, you know, if you didn't think you cheated, chances yeah. are you're you're not gonna. It's not gonna come out that you cheated. Um, exactly. But if, you, if you're super nervous about it, it's probably a tough situation. Yeah. Have you ever like left a dock that you knew a fish was under just because somebody said there's a fish under it? I mean, I've not fished around area. I've avoided areas before because somebody told me without me intentionally doing it in practice and things like that. Like I'll be like, oh, this, this pocket's good. I'm like, I can't get info, but now you already gave it to me. So <laughs> now I'm just not going to go with that pocket the whole practice. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that should be classified though. Like, I mean, it's not intentional, so it doesn't matter. But I still, I got feel better not doing it. And it's also where the news is coming from, the information coming from. Like, I was fishing on the lake I live on a day ago, and a lady's like, "Oh, the big ones are jumping right up front. They're all carp. They're all carp. <laughs> They're like all every carp one of them are carp. The best. 
<laughs> but she doesn't know that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that happens a lot. What doesn't happen a lot is a guy leading Big Bass of the Year. Phoenix Boats Big Bass of the Year. This year pays an extra $10,000. Everybody shook your hand. I listened to Gerald Swindle and I think Brock Mosley maybe were on the live mix the day it got broken saying, you might as well just give Cobb the check now. And then Jason Christie came in at literally a moment. I mean, you wouldn't think a nine pounder would come in at that point. Um, <laughs> what was your reaction? Pissed? <laughs> well, I was pretty pissed at first because I looked out of the way in the bag and I was like, dang, because he didn't think it was a nine pounder. He didn't think it was going to beat mine. I should have like bet him. Be like, I tell you what, whichever one of us wins, we each get five grand, <laughs> which I should have because he didn't think it was big enough. But then I got to think about you. I was like, you know, technically, it was a lot harder to catch a nine pounder at Lay Lake than an eight twelve at Okeechobee. So he kind of deserved it. Like, if you really think about it, there's been a bazillion 812s called at Okeechobee. There's probably been not that many nine pounders called at Lay Lake. So no kidding. he deserved it. Yeah, no, it was a shocker. I mean, <laughs> I, to, to me, you know. We were actually talking about it, and we were like, about the only shot it has to get beaten is if somebody goes out in the Erie and catches a 10-pound smallmouth, which well, is that's what I thought. highly <laughs> unlikely. But yeah. little did you know, Lay Le- Lake had something to say about that. Uh, um, it was, yeah, I thought I ahead. had that one, but I thought I had it, but that's okay. We, we've, we've had, we had a pretty good spring run anyway. You've had an incredible year. Um, what... Uh, what would meaning that if you if you do pull off this angler of the year title, what what would that mean to you at this point in in your career? Uh, well, so I think I told you or before we've talked about it that when I fished FLW before, I was what I prided myself on was consistency. Yeah, like I finished in the top eight in points or so, like multiple times, and then I came to Bass and it was like I won a couple of tournaments and then I'd finish. 90th or like top 10 which i guess sort of what i did this year but only one 90th but i feel like i got my consistency back and that's what i've always prided myself in fishing is being consistent like i don't care i like i'd love to win a tournament every year but i want to be as consistent as possible to that's how you make a long career i mean you need to win every now and then but being consistent is how you do it and angler of the year is like i mean that's literally the like pinnacle of consistency <laughs> like that's all that's the best you can do being consistent so i, I feel like it would be like a milestone for me of getting to the point I've been wanting to be at since I started. With on the list list of importance, I mean, obviously, Angler of the Year is is a lot closer to reality right now. Um, have you, where have you been on that argument? Classic or Angler of the Year? Always, which would you rather win? I mean, obviously, the classic pays more, but I still think Angler of the Year is probably a little harder. I think, yeah, I, 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 like prestigious wise it might be the classic but i think accomplishment wise probably angler of the year i would i would prefer angler of the year probably just because it i mean i guess there's just as many people win the classic as angler of the year but like it took the whole nine months to win angler of the year like it's hard yeah yeah it's and i get that i mean i've always whenever people say that i'm like classic all day long just because the classic is the classic but but i think that as far as like a step in your career, as far as acceptance amongst, not that you're not accepted, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. you're an angler of the year. Like um, it's, it's a season long battle. And um, yes. this one's weird though. Like when looking at the top 10 going into the last event, it, it there's always a small mouth guy in the top four that they're like, Oh, when we uh-huh. get there, <laughs> It's really not, but there is front looking sonar guys. Yes, there dangerous. definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between a small mouth guy and a forward facing sonar guy? Not nowadays? much, not much, <laughs> <laughs> not much anymore. Other than the small mouth guys know how to use front looking sonar and know where they live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot, do you think we had a lot of small mouth guys kind of struggle at St. Clair? Do you think yeah. that was forward facing sonar? In, in full effect or do you think equalizing i think it might have been front face and sonar like equalizing and then also i kind of feel like st Clair's a little bit of a unique smallmouth fishery yeah because to me it's more like what i explain st Clair like anybody from anybody from around here that asked me like what's st Clair like i'm like well so it has no topography it's more comparable 
to fishing a giant hydrilla flat until you're looking for that little group of fish yeah. than it is smallmouth fishery. So like St. Clair is a northern smallmouth fishery, but it fishes different. It's more comparable to a big hydrilla flat in Florida. You just drift yeah. until you find a group. That's what it is. Uh, so it's a uh, it's just different. I think I don't think like I could see smallmouth typical northern really good anglers. Not I mean St. Clair's just kind of a crapshoot. Yeah. It's literally like playing a scratch off ticket. That's like what I told everybody. You just drift along until like <laughs> oh there's a dot. Let me throw it over there. Scratch it off. See what up oh, four and a half. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> were you amazed by the number of boats that were in Anchor Bay? Yeah that that was that was probably one of the most annoying tournaments I've ever had as far as that goes. Cause the first day I literally fished by myself the whole day. Other Shane came and fished with me for a little while. Cause we share all our places, but, and then the second day there was like three boats there and 10 locals. And then the third day it was like 40 boats there. I felt like the whole field was there that made the top 50 and then all the locals, like 120 of them. <laughs> So it wow. was just it was just frustrating because you could tell like word got around and just boats kept showing up, whether or not they knew what they were fishing. It's just it was frustrating. That was because because I was really excited on day two. I was like, man, nobody fished with me on day one. Like I was the only one. I mean, I only caught 20 and a half, but I was like, I was the only one there. Not so much on day two. No. And but, and like you said, you don't know whether they knew what they were fishing, but you don't have to anymore like as long as you know that there's pods of fish floating around here just yeah, stroll around and point my spotlight around see what we see go find them um yeah, yeah no that that um that word definitely spread around about that area and yeah. uh a lot of pressure uh, on said area but it still amazes me that that many fish were there i mean you think about anchor bay and how it's played in the past it's never been no. as big a player um but I mean, it it relatively, I mean, the weights didn't really go down either each day. Like the people in there, the different people caught them, but it didn't. I mean, it had just made big bags the whole time as it did on the first two days. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. crazy. Because what a lot what? of people don't realize too, it's not even deep in there. There's nowhere deep in there. It's like, no. I mean, the deepest points, 12 foot, it's all like the same. It's not even like they could go hide out somewhere in there. Like, <laughs> Was it just bait? Do you think that's what it was? They were yeah. It was something to do with those crawfish because yeah. they'd spit them up in the whole lake, but up there, like it was like all the crawfish in the lake were. I don't. I don't know what they were doing. I have no idea how crawfish spawn or like what the. I don't know what crawfish do, but they were all up there for some reason. They molt, and and I and as far as I know, it happens around a full moon, which was it happening was, um, yeah, about to right. happen. Um, and uh, and you could see. I noticed it at the weigh-in, like you could literally see as people held up fish, there was like an orange tinge to some of the fish because they, I guess, similar to redfish, how they, you know, they get iodine or whatever in their body and, and kind of change a little color. But uh, yeah, you, they were definitely, and you could smell it. I'll tell you that. There is you could, I, my live wells, I couldn't use recirculate all week. I had to run on auto the whole time because after about an hour, there'd be so many crawfish clogged in the screen that it wouldn't recirculate <laughs> i just pumped fresh water in the whole time how are you about fishing in a crowd um obviously you wanted to keep the area to yourself but do you like fishing in a crowd do you dislike it I, I don't hate it actually like i've actually done pretty well in the i don't i mean obviously prefer not to but the community hole style tournaments where you're sitting with a lot of boats i've generally performed pretty well because usually when I see people catch them, a lot of people, it gets in their head and they'll be like, oh God, I'm not catching them. Everybody else is. I kind of like it because it tells me like, you know, there's a bunch here. Like yeah. I, I can catch them. If they're like, they're catching them, I can definitely catch them. And I, I mean, like I've fished some at the Potomac River. I fished some, like some of those ledge type tournaments, you know, and I usually, I mean, I'm not going to, I win the community quite often <laughs> on those. I mean, I didn't say Claire, but. Quite often I'll be in like if I'm in a group, I usually do better than most of them. Like you can tell by you get to day three and you're like, hey, I'm the only one left. <laughs> do do you think that's a mental thing? I think it is. Yeah. 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 I think like you just can't people get in a rush. Like I know that, especially in Florida. That that you know, that's where it happens a lot. It's Florida type places. People see a lot of people catching fish and they go faster and faster and therefore they catch less and less. Yeah. Yeah. So years ago I remember a guy told me like dock fishing for example he said you know everybody chum tries to run in front of the boats you know what i mean cut it off and 
nobody likes that guy. But like, like if you literally pull in the dock right behind them, if you watch a lot of people, and I don't know if it happens as much at the elite series level, but all of a sudden they start speeding up because there's just somebody there. And, and yeah. if you take your time, things can happen. But that's uh, right. Do you believe you're going to win Angler of the Year? I mean, I got to think I am. We got uh, we got two hurdles to climb, but I feel I feel confident. Like I don't, I don't like those. I mean, I don't necessarily love the lakes, but I feel like I, I'm just. I mean, I, if if I make the cuts, you know, top thirties, that's my goal. Like, I obviously I love the top ten, the next two, but I want to get beat, not give it up. If that makes sense. Yeah. It, 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 like I, I, if I just want a top thirty, if if top average a 20th place or so in the next two that wins it wins if not i did my best so that's kind of kind of the goal I, I i don't have unrealistic expectations but i need to top five the next two which i might need to who knows <laughs> but it's uh just just make the cut be consistent all year i just took one tournament at a time and like i don't necessarily say i say I've been fishing for the win or anything I've just literally been fishing I haven't had the best practices this year I've just been like well that's that's I think that's what I've done this year better and that's what I want to do in the last two to not you know not regret what's happened like not regret a tournament or something is I haven't had the best practices but rather than doing something crazy or maybe you know I'm traveling with a few guys maybe doing something that they suggest because I haven't had good practice I've just been like well caught three doing this kind of sucked but that's all I got let me go do that and it's generally worked out so I, I won't regret it as long as I listen to myself. Aside from that, is there anything that feels different this season? Because regardless of whether you win this title, dude, mm -hmm. you had an angler of the year season. I always, I hate that at the end of the year, one person wins it and one. everybody <laughs> looks at like second and third and is like, oh, yeah, too bad you didn't have a great, they had a great year. I mean, just somebody gets ahead at the finish line and that's your champion. Right. Um, yeah. Does does it feel any different to you? Um, it, it the, what feels different is simply that I haven't doubted what I've done all year. Yeah. Like I, I, every t every year, you look at your bad tournaments and you're like, like you might have not really figured much out in practice, but then you watch the top ten on live day just to see what they're doing. You're like, gosh, they're doing what I kind of thought might work in practice, but didn't trust. And I haven't doubted that this year, even even if I didn't think no for sure it was the best. Like, you know, that's what I got. Let's do it. And this year, there's been hardly any tournaments where I doubted my decisions. That makes sense. I mean, and it, that's the kind of point that I've always brought up on the people I've watched win Angler of the Year, the ones that win Angler of the Year. I mean, Aaron is a prime example because I I saw him win it twice, but I also saw him have tough tough seasons. And you would see Aaron in it, and like Angler of the Year seasons, it would be like, they're on that point, I'm moving. He goes to that point. Yeah. On other seasons, it's like, you think they're on that point? <laughs> or, you know, maybe they're in the back. You know, some guys are fishing break. Like, these. once you start, but I guess the question is, how do you... So, moving forward Man. from this, you've recognized that to be the right space to be in your head as a competitor. Regardless of how this finishes, how do you make sure you're in that space again next year, or can you? I, I, I mean, it's a it's a momentum thing, like you said, yeah. or like, like that's what happens. Or everybody knows you get on streaks, and dude, if you could figure out how that happens, you'd be the greatest fisherman or greatest of anything of all time. But I don't know. I, like it's it's lack of doubt, obviously, in your plan. But with that being said, it's all if you make four or five bad decisions in a row, there's no way you can't have doubt. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> like I, I don't know. There, I don't know how you can be in that mindset exactly, but I do know like some tournaments when I'm having a bad day, it usually comes down to trying to make something out of nothing. Like, like you do some crazy decisions, like hail mary type stuff that doesn't work. Like I know some of the tournaments, like Lay Lake. One day I was kind of having a bad day, like wasn't catching anything, and I just did. Like, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but like, I only got to get five bites. Let me just catch one. And I caught one. And I'm like, all right, well, I just need one more bite. And I caught one and never ran around, never got crazy, never was up the river, never like, I ah, had a couple bites down at the dam. Let me go check that out. I just like, well, you know, I've never fished this pocket. It looks pretty good. Let me just go around it and see. And I think it's more like, don't, don't get too drastic 
to be to be consistent like that, you just can't get too drastic with decisions. Like Duke, I know you see tournaments. They're like, well, I was running up the river, you know, and something in the back of my mind told me to run all the way back to the dam, and I won the tournament. That's just not me. That's not my style. Like I I, I don't like driving the boat that much. I don't like running around. I like to fish. <laughs> And uh, so I think that's the way for me to be successful and continue the success I've had. It's fish the way you want. And that's for me, that's just co covering water, picking everything apart, fishing, not not the uh, like jump around swindle style where hit a million different places, run wide open up and down the lake. So that's just what's worked for me. Have you always been the kind of person that you got to fish to figure it out? Like there's some people I've seen, which amaze me, like they look at a map. I've yeah. I've watched people look at a map on a body of water they've never been to and be like, right in these bays here, that's where it's all going to go down. Don't know how, don't know what depth of water, but it's going to be one. And it gets one there, and you're like, what? No, I suck at practice, dude. I usually don't even figure out exactly what I want to do till about 10 a.m. the first day of the tournament. I hate being an early boat the first day of the tournament because like nine out of ten times, I don't catch anything till like 10 o'clock. And I'm like, well, I just wasted half my day. Like, I don't know. It, I, it, take, it takes me a while, but everybody jokes with me because they say I fish like, like an old man, like slow. But I, I really, I really don't fish that slow, but I fish like thorough. I guess you'd say when I know there's fish there, I fish really fast till I get the right instinct feeling. And it takes me that during like the tournament. But, but with that being said, I can't run around. Like you said, like, I can't look at a map and be like, Oh, that looks good because I need to like see the cover or the bank or whatever. And that's how I get like dialed in. I guess you'd say. You say that you suck at practice, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who who do you think is really good at practice? Like, I mean, you spend enough time with anglers now that you're like. I mean, well, so, I mean, the only people I really know specifically is the guys I like to talk to, you know, yeah. routinely. Hamner is pretty good at practice. Hamner's pretty good. Patrick is good, but lies at practice. <laughs> <laughs> you always tell him, you talk to Patrick, like, I, I think, you know, I think they're biting a the jerk bait pretty good. I, it's, it's it's okay. Then he's going to win with a hundred pounds on a jerk bait. But <laughs> anyway, like me and Shane, I know we, we're absolutely got off of practice. Like it's terrible. Like we don't ever find anything or we do. I think part of it is we catch one or two and we're like, well, you know, we got that if nothing else. And we go somewhere else. We don't know how good it is. And then the guys that are good at practice are the guys that catch one or two in the area. Like, oh, that's one or two. Let me see what else is here. And they catch 10, 15. And they're like, oh, it's really good. But they caught 15 out of there. Yeah. I think I think that's the difference between being bad at practice and good at practice. So is, is it better better to be bad at practice? I kind of feel like that. I, I, I kind of feel like. And then the other side of that is too. So there's, there's a double-edged sword. So if you fish an area too long in practice. So you know it's good, right? Well, you 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 if there's a ton of fish there, it's good because you know it's good, but then you've caught too many, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you just literally heard it. But then a lot of times what hurts me sometimes is I might catch three in 10 different areas, right? And five of those areas are really good, but five there was just those three. And if you don't catch a lot, you don't know. But I did find 10 areas right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Oh, he's getting a call. Busy guy. Do you get a call? Oh, you You're my back. Mom. My mom oh. called me. Hi, mom. I forgot to tell you, put your phone on do not disturb. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we do one of those, put your phone on do not disturb. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that, that makes sense. And it makes sense to me the way you fish as a person. You, you know, your style of fishing. If you get to them something on day one of practice, like, John Cox has explained it to me, and I, I really like his theory where he's like, in a perfect world, you get one day of practice because he's like, he's like, I go to a lot of bodies of water and I, I feel this myself, whether we're shooting a show or whatever, you go to a lot of bodies of water and you might not catch them the first day. But generally, by day two, even if you got your skull caved in on day one, by day two, you spend a little time that night thinking about, you know, different things, get ready, get ready, and you go catch them on day two, but you're you're chasing the bite that's actually happening as opposed to now, if you find them on day one on boat docks and they start moving from those, by the time the tournament starts, you're screwed. Um, yeah. You, you say that, but so, you know what I've always thought is funny. And I actually was thinking about this at last, like a lot this year, 
the very first bass I've caught of practice, like or I'm not gonna say like a 10 inch, very first decent bass I've caught of practice for like the last five years has generally been what I ended up doing in the tournament and worked. I don't, so I guess I might not be as bad at practice. I just don't ever realize it's a thing. But generally, like that's what it is. The first like technique or bass I catch in practice, that's what I do. Wow. So why, why not just go in after that? <laughs> most of the time that's what i mean it might only be one or two bites you know but then i don't catch anything for the next three days and i'm like well got that one i caught the first day of practice first morning that's what we're gonna go do <laughs> and it usually works out <laughs> but it, it's, it's the first hour or the last hour of practice i feel like are the most important parts what's your take uh, are you like a daylight to dark practice angler or um no nah, i mean i usually i'm more of a dark practice but or darkish at least i don't i don't unless it's like a shad spawn bite or stuff something i don't get out there at like the dead crack like we can be out 30 minutes before sunrise i'm more like about a sunrise guy all right, all right. yeah like I don't, i'm not uh i'm not like a john cox at 9 a.m guy because i've seen cox roll up at 9 a.m but i'm not i'm not a i'm not a carl jockson 4 a.m either yeah yeah. Is, is that got to do with fishing or has that got more to do with you like to rest? I hate getting up early. Like I just I, I don't like if I don't have anything to do, then I like I just don't like getting up early. I like to stay up late. I don't like getting up early. So what time do you stay up to it around a tournament? I mean a tournament I usually go to bed pretty early because I got to. I mean like ten o'clock, you know. But when I'm okay. home and don't have anything to do, I mean anywhere from I can't go to sleep if I don't like have to get go to sleep. Like eleven to two. Maybe if you turn off that video game, you'd have an easier time not, falling asleep. It's like, not even I'll that. Off, no, I cut it off at like ten o'clock. Sometime I'm gonna go to bed early at night, and I go lay in bed for two hours. Like oh, I can't go to sleep, and I get back up and go watch TV for two more hours. Can't how go you're sleep. wired. It's how you yep, wired. Can't go sleep. <laughs> uh, John Cox, you mentioned him. I mentioned him. Is he? frustrating to compete against because i feel i would feel like there's got to be some frustration because dude catches him dude won't put that unit on dude starts at 9 a.m sometimes you know fishes all over the like as a competitor is that frustrating or inspiring i like it it's inspiring i like it i want to fish with john cox i me and him have never fished together and i feel like we'd have so much fun i but agree I, I think we fish kind of the same and like we just i don't know i, I i'm I'm almost jealous that because because like I fish like him, but then sometimes like the like I doubt it a little bit, you know. Like I like I've caught enough fish deep and done well enough like offshore to where like if I'm not catching any shallow, I'll be like you know I'll go do this and it works out because I'm marginal at deep fishing. Like, but sometimes I'm jealous that he can just be like, you know, I'm gonna fish my wacky worm down the bank uh, the whole week. Might work, might not. That's what I'm going to do. Sometimes I'm jealous that he can make himself do that, which I've had a lot of tournaments. And I mean, I guess that's like St. Clair. I fished with front looking sonar offshore, which isn't my favorite and worked out for me. And he kind of had a rough go, at least the first day. Yeah. Up showers. So, you know, I mean, it works out, but also sometimes I'm jealous that he can just, like, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do regardless. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing to watch. I mean, in his lack of a sense of urgency or anything, like it he's is. the only dude that's ever idled away at the top 10 takeoff and like kept idling, just kept idling right over to his spot. And I'm like, why did you do that? Like, I mean, just even the, I mean, there'd be the part of me that there's people here. I got to go fast to uh, not, not, it doesn't exist in him. He's no. very calm, cool and collected, but you are too. I'd say you're a very chill person. No. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I don't get worked up ever, really, as far as when fishing. I mean, like, it doesn't work. It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. It, like, I don't pretty even killed. What, what what does get you worked up? I uh, really don't know. I don't get worked up too much, actually. When's the last time you were, like, pissed? Somebody cut you off? Yeah, I mean, I've got pissed before fishing wise. Like people cut me off. I guess like I don't get worked up with things that are out of my control. Fishing. There you go. Okay. That's a better way to put it. Like losing fish or like not catching anything. Or I mean, I guess that's in your control because somebody always catches. Them. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it's not. But yeah, I guess I get I get worked up. Somebody cuts me off or like 
like all the guys on St. Clair fishing around me the other day. I was, I guess I was a little annoyed. Yeah. But that's normal. That's normal. Yeah. What's the coolest thing about being a Bassmaster Elite Series pro? The coolest thing about I mean, it's got it's got to be the fans now. So, like, I fished pro for a while, right? Like, yeah. it's not. Uh, I mean, I think this is my eleventh year technically pro, but up till I was an elite series pro, I never got stopped at gas stations. I never got like walking through the mall or something like, "Hey, are you Brandon?" Like, yeah, that never happened. And the last few years, like, it's pretty cool. It, it it's pretty cool that when somebody knows you and it like they want to meet you, you know, like it's. I don't know, something I've never dealt with really until the last few years, and that's being on the elites. It's very cool. And uh, do you feel a pressure with that? Like, does it change you at all, or it's just it's just a cool thing that happens sometimes? I don't think, no, I don't feel a pressure. I think I used to feel a pressure, like, as far as, you know, when you have fans watching and things like that, like, you've got to perform because they're, like, disappointed in you. But, like, I think that's before you have success you feel like that or much success you know and then once you've done well enough times you're like well no i obviously can do well sometime so it's not yeah. that you don't worry about as much yeah i mean you your resume speaks for itself and and you all, you also play a sport that dude is ridiculous like the <laughs> odds of winning are so low like you look at van dam just fished his last competitive event and He's done it. He won 29 times, 25 at Bass, four over there. And that's unbelievable. He's done it for 33 years. So he hasn't even won one a year. And he is like the most dominant. Like you could take half his resume and you know what I mean? And it, it, it's still number one. So how do you stay up when you're in such a, like, it's such a weird, like I would imagine that it's got to be hard at times. It, like you have to take, you have to have enjoy. Like like for instance, thirty first at St. Clair the other week, not that great, but it made me happy. Like it, yeah. like I, I was happy with. If, if you, I know there's guys that's like I'm not content unless I win. I'm like well, you're gonna have a long miserable career. <laughs> like <laughs> like it, it, you probably are gonna do pretty well, but you're gonna be pissed like ninety percent of the time because you're not gonna win. Like I, I mean. Like, it makes me happy. If I top 10, I'm happy. Like, yeah, if you could have won, it's kind of disappointing. Like, oh, I didn't win. But I think that's how you find and keep enjoyment. And it. it's like, you got to be happy with the success you have. Like, one of my pet peeves is uh, <laughs> somebody's probably going to be looking at my social or somebody's going to know they said this on my social media. And they're like, oh, man, I pissed him off. But Good so time. if I post like, like, Good tournament at so and so. Finished eleventh. They're like, oh, keep your head up. You'll do better in the next one. I'm like, or keep your head up. That's what they always say. Keep your head up. Like you know that. Like I'm, it's, I'm pretty happy with the left. I don't know what you expected. But not that good. Like, but that's like, like you just gotta find happy. You gotta enjoy the finishes you have. The the you gotta be happy with them. It's weird though. Like when you look at other sports too, like. You know, it's it's funny how some sports, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this, but some sports like reward positions outside of first. Like if you finish second or third in a Formula One race, they give you a giant <laughs> bottle of champagne and you guys are spraying it all over each other. And sure, you didn't win, but but it was a winning week for the team. That's um, right. But in pro fishing, it's like you finish second. People are like, I'm sorry, man. But it it's just weird how certain sports. It is. Like to, to get a bronze medal in the Olympics, people are like, Congratulations, you got a bronze. Nobody's like, sorry, two dudes beat you. Um, no, but fishing it is. It's weird that way. It, fishing, literally that saying that second place is the first to lose. I think that came from fishing. Like that's, that's it definitely uh, yeah. It definitely feels that way. What's the toughest uh tournament? I mean, do, have you how tough is that to recover from? And it's hard to talk to people when they're having a tough time about it. You're having a great season, so I can talk to you about that. But that almost winning an event and getting crushed yeah. at the very it, – like it is a heartless situation. Everybody, the media, everybody runs to that person. You're all by yourself literally kicking stones up the road. And like how do you recover from that? And And how tough is that to get over? 
I think it depends on how it happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> so like like Okeechobee this year, I finished third, had a chance to win, right? And like I did I wasn't that disappointed because like I hit a mega school of fish that got me to leading and gave me the chance to win and didn't know if they'd ever show back up. Knew realistically I didn't have a good chance that they didn't. And yeah. it's kind of like I feel like I made the most out of what I had. But then like Another example of that, like a few years ago, the Forest Wood Cup at Lake Murray, I was leading and just lost fish, missed fish, like things hit the fan bad on day three. And I would have won if uh, if things hadn't gone wrong. And that sucks. Like that takes a long time to get over. It, it, if you feel like it was your fault, then it's bad. But like there's a lot of tournaments going in. Santee, for instance, I was in second in Santee and going into day th- four, I think. And realistically, didn't feel like I had any chance to win. I know it was a second, but like I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. Felt like I was hanging on to a thread all week. So like if I'd have won, it would have been like, holy crap, I won. How? But yeah. so I, th- I think it depends. The situation depends on how rough it is. Yeah. When when you see stuff happen, like you talked about in the Forest Wood Cup, losing a bunch of fish. And when you see that happen to an angler in the final day, in any other sport, people would be like, well, he's speeding up. He's trying to catch the – he's trying to turn. In football, they'd say you're trying to turn before you've actually made the reception. You know what I mean? In every sport, there'd be a different analogy. But in fishing, it's just like always oh, having bad luck. Do you think it's often bad luck or do you think – like when you go back and look at the Forest Wood Cup footage, was that just – it was just not your day? Or do you, when you watch it, are you like, yeah, I was – rushing them or i was doing something different yeah i think i i don't know it, it's it's hard to say because like a lot of times you do get in a rush and you lose fish yeah. cause of it you don't fish places as thoroughly as you would but then like like at least in my experience the ones that i've had a chance to win and didn't it was just simply i'm not gonna say bad luck but just things that happen fishing that happen all the time it just seemed way worse because you were leading <laughs> like it's just your typical like fishing you're not gonna catch every fish like yeah. it, it doesn't happen and i don't know that your day was necessarily worse on that day four when you lost but it just seemed worse because you would have won oh, <laughs> if the, it situation. Didn't happen. the same thing happened on days one two and three you just it didn't seem as significant you know what i mean yeah yeah so no, I, I, think that's what I agree with that one thing we found out last time you're on the podcast is you're a big connoisseur of expensive is it bourbon or, or whiskey bourbon. or bourbon? bourbon? Yeah. If if you win this title, is there a particular bottle of bourbon you got but, your eye on? I don't know. I I don't know if I would buy a high end bottle or not. Probably would. I probably I'd probably have to get a bottle of like so a lot of people everybody's heard of Pappy, you know, like Pappy 15, 23. Everybody knows about that. That's super expensive bourbon. But I actually prefer the Van Winkle 12 year, which is like seven hundred dollars. I mean it's high. Don't get me wrong, super expensive, but it's not seven grand. So might be seven grand. 23 year, I think, is like five to seven. No, it depends. So all this, so wow. all that price, all that price is kind of crap, though. It's not, it's not like it costs that much to make or anything. It's just they like a uh, uh where anywhere you could buy it might get one bottle of every two years. So they can sell it for whatever they want. Wow. It depends. It depends on who you know and what it costs. So if I put a bunch of shots out for you, would you be able to tell me like, like if I, I I feel like when I go to restaurants and they tell me to smell like the wine cork and I smell it, I take a little sip and like I've, I've had somewhere I was like, that's not good. Like, I know I don't like that, but other than it not being good (laughs) and that being good, I don't know the difference. I mean, I'm not, there's a nutty hue to this one or I don't have any of that. Yeah, to an extent, I can taste it. Like, so I can usually taste like the high end versus the cheap ones. But the problem is, like, the different proofs in them, how strong they are. That's what makes it like just your palate. Like, do you want that? You know, do you want one that strong or whatever? Or do you like the vanilla notes or the caramel or whatever? And then, but like, to get the different taste in it, I don't, I don't know that my palate's that refined. I just like it. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
You are a odd, peculiar person. I mean, we have literally talked on this podcast in depth on noodling, and now we're getting in depth on collective bourbons. What is the most expensive bourbon in Earth? Like, is there in something? Earth, oh, I don't know. I, I have no idea what would be the. I like, there's like, God, I was part of a bourbon club, and there's some that's like 10, 12 grand. I don't, I mean, you were I, part I, of a bourbon club. Yeah, well, they just send you like, uh, yeah, they send you like samples every month, they, and they give you availability to buy some of the high ends because they'll open up, and they're like, you can purchase this now. I mean, I never bought any of the expensive ones, but I would just get the bourbon of the month sample, and they send you a bottle and different samples. It's oh, like jelly of the bourbon. month, but bourbon. Yeah, yeah, it comes every cool. month. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That is most pretty of cool. them. Most of free samples, though, obviously were free for a reason. <laughs> we're that good well dude i hope you uh i hope everything happens i know everything will happen the way it's meant to be like i do feel that that's the weird thing and i think do you think that's a real thing or do you think that's something people just say to keep saying in the competitive environment it'll dude, finish I used to think, the way it's meant I used to, to. Think, yeah that, that, i know that's the same efficient i used to not really believe that but then like joey having a five pounder jump in his boat when he was going to live it like, i don't know maybe it is like some of the tournaments i've won like or the couple i won i look back i'm like things literally went perfect i think that's what like it's meant to be means like you just can't lose one like it's impossible you I literally can't lose them like you could hook them on one hook like i caught an eight pounder in the side of that fork tournament one I, I mean it didn't matter i would have won without the eight pounder but at the time, I would have never landed that fish normally. It's just, I guess, meant to be. It might be a thing. I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's got to be. I mean, Joey had one literally jump in his lap. Like, come on. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, and literally it jumped right before that. <laughs> it jumped right beside the boat. And I talked to him about this. And I'm such an idiot. Like, I literally was just about to. Because me and Zona were unlocked together at the time. I was about to say, it's about to jump in the boat. <laughs> because it almost did. <laughs> and like a second <laughs> later, it literally jumped in the boat. Um <laughs> I, I gotta so, tell you something funny about Joey before we get. Oh yeah, him. please, he, please. Yeah. Uh, so he used to fish the FLW tours co angler, yeah. right? Yeah. And one FLW tournament, he was my co angler at Pickwick, and he kept. He was like the best co angler ever. He'd get hung and just like break it off. Like he didn't even care. Like, I'm like, dude, you should have told me that was like a freaking jerk <laughs> bait. We just lost back there. But anyway, and uh, he kept breaking his leader and he'd be sitting down there for every time his leader. So I taught him how to tie an FG knot during the tour on Pickwick. And now he's kicked my butt twice with a freaking FG knot. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of wish you had it just said, Go Google on FG knot. <laughs> so I sat down on the boat during the tour on Pickwick and tied his FGs far. And now he beats me with him. Yeah. He's he's done pretty good. Um <laughs> it's and and he's similar to you, dude, in the way that previous to the Elite series, he was Mr. Consistent. You know what I mean? Had got to the point, mm -hmm. and especially it, you know, has had some great small mouth events. Um but but I, when I talked to him, he was, you know, we were even talking about him collegiate fishing. And I'm like, which ones stand out? And I'm like, did you win one? He's like, nah, we didn't win. Like, he wasn't a winner. And that sounds horrible to no, say that. Good. But he was a guy who was consistent. And now he looks like Godzilla. I mean, he's yep. leading Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year. And he's trying to freaking chase you down yes. for Angler of the Year. Um, yeah. Why do you th like? Have you had any chance to think about why that happened for you? And why, like, you know what I mean? You won two in your first season. Yeah, I, I really just almost think it comes down to like, like you can't really win a tournament that doesn't go in your wheelhouse. Yeah, and like Lake Fork, I won. I was literally blueback hair and fishing on a lake that didn't have blueback hair and that nobody knew how to do that. So, <laughs> like, I beat everybody because nobody was doing it because it was what I like to like knew how to do. And I think Joey's the same way. He loves front looking sonar. He loves to do that. And he's like St. Clair, he just found fish that nobody found. But like Seminole, he was like broke the mold of what the fish should have been doing because it was it was his style of fishing. Yeah. So I think I think that's just I think to win a tournament, you very rarely see people win tournaments that's not what they like to do or know how to do. Yeah. But like I mean, you people do well, but like somebody like Hackney, like Hackney. It would have been weird if Hackney had won St. Clair on front loop. I mean, Hackney can win anywhere. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. 
Yeah. But, but that's not like I think you just win with tournaments that fit your wheelhouse, and the two Joey's won has fit his, the two I won fit mine. So yeah. I think that's what happens. Yeah, the versatility, and you have to be extremely versatile to make it on the elite series. But the versatility but more win. or less comes in not with the wins. The versatility <laughs> gets you in the classic and in win angler of the year and things like that. Right. But but to actually win an event, you're right. It seems like it has to set up the way you the way you like to catch them. Well, let's That's hope right. these la- let's hope these last two set up well for you. And and I hope so. Maybe we'll do a podcast with some rich nutty. What 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 did you say? What, you, what, what ben, we, ben Rich Winkle Nutty 12. sounds ben, bad. Ben, ben Winkle twelve. Van Winkle twelve. That's yeah. what that's what the goal is. A bottle of Van Winkle twelve. Yeah. Dude, you've had an incredible season, and uh, you are a freaking onion. You you literally. I mean, have we ever had a guest that had more varied? I mean, we didn't even get into your video gaming addiction and all that. And how is that? Are you? In, is it under control? <laughs> Me and Shane just got masters in Apex in the last three days. So, what does that mean? That's the highest level in Apex. Wow. So, yeah. So you're me, Apex and Shane, me and Shane have been grinding. Well, the season ends this weekend. So, we had to get back from St. Clair and hurry up and grind it before the season ended. You know? <laughs> so, uh, a video game grind, how late does that go into the night? Uh, it depends. It depends. Some, it, it, sometimes it depends on when we start. I mean, it might be 10, could be two o'clock in the morning. You never know. Wow. Depends on how it's going. Ever, ever drink a Van Winkle 12 during that or no, no drinking. No, I've drank some bourbon. Usually though, you get into the bourbon in the video games, the video games don't go very well. It goes bad. Yeah. It stops <laughs> the reaction time down a little bit, you know, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of helps in life really other than a good time. I mean, you really, you, you don't, you never see somebody like, Hey, that, He's a much better football player when he's drunk. <laughs> generally, generally not the case. Dancing might be the only thing, but I don't even know if you're really better at it. You just think you are. Yeah, no, I don't think it helps it. It's just like you're out there thinking it helps it. But, dude, thanks very much for uh, for another incredible conversation, and I can't wait to watch our Angler of the Year battle go down to the wire. It's going to be down to the wire. Thank you for having me on talking about all kind of weird stuff. That's that's our specialty. There you have it straight from the C-O-double-B's mouth. Man, one point lead with eight, potentially eight days of competition left in the Elite Series competition. Obviously, he doesn't have to fish all of those to win this, or maybe he does. Depends on what his nearest pursuant is. Stone Cold Kyle Welcher does, and and a bunch of characters right behind him trying to chase them all down. It's going to be a fun finish to the season. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know in the comments, who do you think is going to win Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year? Who do you think is going to win the Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year? Let me know. We'll find out over the next couple of weeks. And next week, we have a very special episode happening next Wednesday, too. So make sure you come back for that. And... um As always, enjoy being, have a great week, and Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?